Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. And our God is the God of new creations. It's couches, porches, and kitchen tables. It's stories shared and moments worth remembering. It's hoping and praying and taking chances. It's jokes and laughter and shoulders to cry on. It's questions and answers and I don't knows. It's knowing you don't have to figure it all out by yourself. It's messy and imperfect. It's giving and serving and growing better together. It's life and we weren't meant to do it. Life is better together. Join a small group today. Giving is easy and safe with our giving platform powered by SecureGive. Giving can be done from anywhere with your computer, tablet, or your mobile device. To give, simply go to the church's website, create a new account, or log in with your existing account. Simply select one-time or recurring gift. Select your donation amount, enter your payment info, and then confirm your information. Visit our website and click on the giving button to learn more. Maybe you're an iOS or Android user. If so, you have an additional opportunity to streamline your giving with the free SecureGive app. Simply search SecureGive in the App Store or Google Play Market. Once downloaded, open the app and search our church name to save as your home organization. Just like with online giving, you can create a new account or use your existing SecureGive account to log in, give, and connect with us. But wait, did you also know there is now a way to participate in generosity in a way that's as easy as texting a friend? With text to give you can give using your mobile device by following these three easy steps. Number one, text the keyword and amount you'd like to give to our church's text to give number. Number two, follow the series of prompts and set up your SecureGive text to give account. Here, choose your desired payment method. And finally, number three, save the number as a contact in your phone for future use. Text to give only takes seconds to use and is the perfect way to connect with our ministry through giving. As you know, faith is not a destination. Faith is a journey. And some of you are pretty far along on that journey. But others of you may have a lot of questions. You may be at the very beginning of your faith journey. And the church, well, the church is the last place you think to speak up or ask your questions or voice your doubts. So let's change that.
The starting point is where questions about God turn into conversations about faith, about your faith. It's a place where you can actually voice your doubts and explore some of the trickiest topics of faith, free from pressure and free from judgment. You see, we'd rather talk with you than at you. And starting point is where that happens. So if you're ready, let's talk. We were not created to live stagnant lives, to be stuck, bound, or broken. We were created with a purpose, a calling, a mandate, a mission. Even in these uncertain times, that calling remains the same, to go into the world to make disciples, to share the love of Jesus. This is the work of Easter, the greatness of God, the power of the resurrection in action. What Jesus did has changed us, made us a new creation, given us an unimaginable hope. Grace has taken root. Mercy has flooded our souls, and the promise of eternity has redefined our everything. So why keep all that to ourselves? It's time to put Easter in motion, to make a difference, to share Jesus with the world around us. If your life has been changed, it's time to get to work.
the God we believe. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the broken door. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. They won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. They won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes the way. Cause the young upon that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God's still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. They won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. We're the house of the Lord. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. It's the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. So shout out your praise. Oh, oh. So shout out your praise. There is joy in this house. There is joy in this house today. Oh, oh. No. Oh. 
Welcome everybody, we are so glad you're joining with us today. And as you probably caught on the video, uh, we have Community Connect coming up really soon and we're excited about it. I hope you are too. So if you have not registered, make sure you register for that. Easy to do, go up to our website, go up to our Facebook page. Facebook page is probably the best place to keep connected with us. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, but make sure you register. You can also go on to Eventbrite and we want, to, want you to make sure you register through Eventbrite because we need to get a great head count of who's coming. But invite your friends out. This is a great opportunity to really support the YWCA and the work that they do. You're going to be hearing more about that that evening. There is free food. There are raffle baskets to give out and we got more and more people just are donating baskets so you got an opportunity to win some really nice stuff as well. And we hope you'll join us for that. So make sure you do that and invite as many friends as you possibly can. But register quickly. Now, as you may have noticed, we are not in our studio this week. So where are we, hun? We are in Irving, Texas. Yes, we are in Texas. We love Texas and we have some friends here. We're actually some friends that you may know that were part of our North Point family. And actually we still consider them part of our North Point family. They just happen to live in Texas right now. So we're gonna visit them a little later on in our trip here. But we are here because of a couple habits that we established a few years back. We are in a series called The Power of Habits and there are some changes that we wanted to make in our lives and we are working hard to make sure them happen. And one of those habits is what? Being able to go to conferences in different parts of the country. So that's pretty cool. We have we joined up years ago with just a group of people who care about their health and nutrition and part of that is coming to conferences once, sometimes twice a year, where we can learn more about our health and how to take care of that. And so we do that, and that's been great. And so one of our habits is, yes, let's travel together, let's enjoy that time together, but we can also learn something together as a married couple. That's been pretty cool. The other habit tied into that is to be around people that have the same goals and desires. And so we get to see people that now we've known for some of them for five, six years, which is really cool. And we got to know some very interesting people, some really neat fitness instructors. 
some people who have been in the health and wellness industry for 25, 30 years. We met, we got friends with an umpire. I mean, it's just cool the people we meet. But we all have the same common desire to, to take care of our health. And so it's neat to hang out together. We inspire each other, we encourage each other, and we also kick each other in the pants, especially when you're not in the gym in the morning with everybody else. <laughs> so anyway, today you're gonna learn something really cool about the power habits. And one of those is something that not only will help you to start new habits, but will give you the power to break bad habits. So hope you'll learn a lot today. Excited to share it with you. So why don't I just pray with you and all of us this morning. Father, thank you so much for the time that we get together, Where, whether it is this morning, whether it's this afternoon that somebody's watching, whether it's later tonight. And may we share together, um, just chatting together. May we just continue to, to form a deeper community together with the same desire and goals to know your son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, help us today to learn something new, to not only to learn it, but to apply it to our lives. And thank you so much for Jesus Christ, his example, his life, and the power that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. So Lord, today may be an awesome day. We pray this to Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you soon. How many of you wish that you could change something in your life? I mean, it could be anything. And, you know, put it up in the chat. That's what I really like you to do is something you could change. Maybe it's a job. Maybe you'd like a different house. Maybe something smaller, something bigger, something different. Maybe it's a different car. Maybe it's a little bit more money in your pocket every month. Maybe it's your hairstyle or maybe it's your size, you know, this way or that way, whatever, you know. Maybe it's a skill or a talent that you'd like to learn and you just haven't done it yet. You know, I've always wanted to learn the piano and I just thought that'd be so cool to be able to sit down and play the keys at night, you know? So what is it that you wish you could change in your life? And it could be just something fun, you know? I like to take up skiing or skydiving or I don't know, whatever it is, bungee jumping. What is it something that you like to change? Okay, now I want you to shift gears a bit and I want you to think about back in the day when you used to take tests. Now I know some of you probably have tests every week because you just have deadlines at work and you got to get it done and it really is a test because if you don't get it done, you're in trouble. But back in the day when you used to take tests and you knew the test was coming on Friday and the teacher told you and reminded you, but now it's Monday and maybe even your mom reminded you and she said, hey, you know, have you studied for your test on Friday? And you say, I will get to it. I'm just taking a little time to watch TV. And then the next day happens and the next day happens and the next day happens and you, you've been very good at watching TV, but you haven't been very good at studying. And now here it is Friday, okay? And you have every excuse in the book of why you didn't study, right? And I'm sure some of you have really, really good excuses and don't hesitate to share them because we all could use good excuses from here to there, you know? So be sharing those. And guess what? Then you go into school and you're ready to take this test and you're hoping you're hoping you're gonna do well on this test. How well do you do? You see, sometimes in life, I think we, we approach it the same way. We approach it with this idea that I, I hope, I hope I could get a better job someday. I, I hope that we could get out of debt. I hope someday we're gonna have a good marriage or a great marriage. I hope I'm gonna be more organized. But see, hope alone won't change your life. It won't. It can't. I, I mean, hope is great. I love hope. I, I, I hope I'm more of a hopeful person than not a hopeful person. I hope you are. But hope doesn't change us. I mean, think about it for a minute. What did you do yesterday? Now, I know some of you are like already like, I have no idea what I did yesterday. But think back a little bit. Okay, it's not that far. What did you do yesterday? You got up, right? You woke up. The alarm went off. Okay, we're not hitting the snooze, right? Because we're not doing that. And you got up and you woke up and you're like, oh, I wish I had more sleep. Why? Because last night you stayed up watching that movie till two o'clock in the morning or you were sc scrolling through Facebook or you were watching all the videos on Twitter or whatever. And, and you're, 
or Instagram or whatever those things are anymore. You know, and so you were doing that and then you stayed up later than you thought. And now you're like, oh, I wish I could sleep more, right? But you get up and you go and hop in the shower. Oh, wait a minute. Before you get in the shower, though, you probably took off your pajamas to get in the shower, right? If you're wearing pajamas, you know, and you took off those because if you didn't, you'd come out of the shower and here you are dripping wet in your pajamas and your roommate or your spouse is looking at you like, what did you do? Oh, I forgot to take my pajamas off, right? And so anyway, you get cleaned up, you get, you get ready for work, and you get dressed, and you drive off to work. Hopefully you got dressed, because if you didn't, that's going to cause some more problems. But hopefully you took that step, you got dressed, you're all ready for work, you drive off to work, and you get to work, right? And then guess what? You go through your day. It wasn't hope that got you through the day, because hope alone won't change your life. Habits will. Habits are what drive us in life. Sometimes, sometimes you ever wonder how you got there? I mean, you ever get to work one day and you're like, oh no, did I brush my teeth? I don't remember brushing my teeth. I, I, I literally don't remember if I brushed my teeth. Or worse, you're like, oh my goodness, did I put on deodorant, right? And you're starting to wonder, oh no, did I or did I not? Oh no, I think I did, right? Or did you ever get home at the end of the day and then you're thinking, I totally do not remind, remember driving home. I just sort of got here. And like, who does that? Who forgets how they drive home, right? And, but you just don't, you don't remember. Most, normally, what we do is not a result of hoping. It's a result of our habits. Now, great studies have been done on habits and, and the habits we do and the habits we don't do. And there was a great study done at Duke University, and it revealed this. This is, this is pretty insightful over 40 percent of the actions you do daily are not a, res a result of the decisions but a result of habits so 40 percent of the things we do pretty much on average throughout the day are not because we thought about it we are just in the habit of doing it habits make up nearly half of what we do in a day who you are and what you are becoming is a result of your habits do you catch that who you are right now is a result of the habits you have had and who you are becoming are the results that you're going to do from now until you get there. So if you want to change your life, you have to change your habits. In other words, change your habits, change your life. It's that simple. And just one habit can be very, very powerful. So today what I want to do is I want to look at the life of one guy and one habit, okay? It's the life of Daniel, and we're just going to look at one little excerpt of his life. To give you a little bit of backstory, Daniel's an Old Testament prophet. He has been taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He comes in with his armies, and they besiege Jerusalem, and they capture all the brightest and the upcoming rising stars of that culture, and Daniel's one of them. So they basically come in and get all the young adults. Daniel's taken off. And what Nebuchadnezzar's idea is, I'm going to train these, I'm going to indoctrinate them into our way, and they will bring their gifts and their talents to our kingdom. So that's what he does. Daniel becomes known as the dream interpreter. And he and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar have a really good relationship. Nebuchadnezzar has some dreams, Daniel interprets them. That goes on for a while. Nebuchadnezzar dies. His son Belshazzar becomes king. We talked about him a few months ago, I think, already. And Belshazzar had a similar event where he had something he couldn't interpret. And it was his handwriting on the wall. Maybe you remember the story. And Daniel comes in and he helps interpret it. Now the third king comes into reign, Darius. And this is under Darius. And so just think about this for a moment. Three times in Daniel's life, he has gone from an unknown to rising star and being highly honored by a culture that was so different than his culture, a God who was so different than the gods of the people that he was involved with in their culture. And he does that three times. And here he is now that, that Daniel is selected by King Darius among 120 of the top people in the country. Not only that, but these 120 people who Darius is going to put in charge of ruling the nation, basically, you know, subdivisions, all that kind of stuff. Daniel is one of three that are in charge of these 120. 
So this is pretty prestigious. Daniel's way up there. Other guys get jealous of Daniel, and they're trying to trip him up. They're thinking, man, we got to trip him up. There's something that will cause him to fall, and there's nothing they can do that causes Daniel to stumble. So one day they come up with a, a brilliant plan. They even say this. They say, hey, listen. He said, finally, these men said this. Said, we will never find any basis for charge against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Now, isn't that a great way to be known? That the only way that they can mess you up is if they can mess up how you interact with God. That here he is in a godless nation and he's known for his faithfulness to his God. So they come with this idea, these men. They come to the king and they say, hey king, we got this idea. You are the best king ever. You, nobody should, should get honor or glory or prestige or anything but you, O oh king, right? So here's what we think you should do, king. You should make a law that says if anybody gives honor or you know, praise or anything like that to anybody else but you, king, you're going to throw them in the lion's den. And the king's like, ah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's go for it. So they make this law that anybody who prays to any other god but the gods of the king, any other who honors anybody but the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. So here's what happens. Now, Daniel. When Daniel, heard, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And he yells, I can't believe this. No, he didn't do that. What did Daniel do? Now, think about it for a moment what Daniel was thinking. He hears that there's this edict. He hears that what he normally does, he can't do. That his relationship with God is now hindered because if he's caught praying, it's gonna, it, it could destroy him. He's going to get thrown in a lion's den. And it's easy to rationale. Like, you know what? I, I, God will understand. He understands the culture I live in. He understands what, I've gone, what I'm going through. And he understands if I just got to close the shutters and pray in private. I, just, I, I guess I just can't do what I used to do. Or I better respect the leaders because God wants me to do that. Respect the leaders at all costs, I guess, you know. And I'm just going to go and do that. Think of the gravity of the situation. If he does this, he's going against the law. He's going against the government. And guess who else? He's going against his friends. I mean, Daniel's friends were not just... You got this little gang of people who follow God. I mean, hopefully you had that, but they were such a remnant at this point. This is many years after Israel had fallen. And Daniel's friends were the friends in the kingdom. He was buddies with people who were worshiping other gods and doing all kinds of things. They would not understand his faith and his allegiance to his God. So what does he do? Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He does what he always does. And guess what these guys do? They tattletale on him. <laughs> so Daniel gets arrested. He gets put into the lion's den. They roll the stone in front of him, in front of the den. Now, this is so cool. Quick lesson on the Old Testament. The Old Testament, what it does is it points you to Jesus. That's what it does. The entire Old Testament will point you to Jesus Christ. And here's another example. Um, and this was pretty blatant, but it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of being put in the tomb. So Daniel goes into the situation that looks deadly. Okay, he's getting thrown into the lion's den. There's no way he's coming out. These lions are hungry. And the stone is rolled in front of this lion's den because he broke the law. I mean, stupid law as it is, but he broke it law, so he has to go in, right? Now the king had got... he. Him and Daniel have this good relationship. And the king, when he realizes what had happened, is like beside himself. He's like, I can't believe I did this, but I can't, not go, I can't go against the, my own law. So I guess we got to do this. But he's hoping and he's rooting for Daniel that Daniel's going to come through. And so the next morning, he comes down to the lion's den and says, Daniel, you, you still in there? You know? And Daniel's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, my, my God rescued me. Why is the king so enamored with Daniel? Why is the king, and the king is like so taken back, he is like, oh my goodness, Daniel, your God is the God. I mean, who else would rescue someone like this? Your God is above all other gods, right? Why would he be doing this? Because Daniel had something that he established a long time ago. And it all started with one holy habit. That's it. 
just one holy habit, three times a day, Daniel would pray to God. He would listen to God. He would get to know God. He would share what's on his heart. And I'm not sure, but I'm guessing his spiritual strength came from that time with God every single day. Because he had the ability to go against the grain. He had the ability to willing to put his life on the line for God he believed in. He had the strength to fight against temptations. And if you don't know the story of Daniel, I mean, he faced a lot of stuff. And he was willing to risk his life. Now, it may seem small. It may seem in, insignificant. And there's all kinds of reasons why Daniel could have stopped. And I bet you could think of all kinds of reasons why you could stop doing the insignificant. Like just praying once a day. But for Daniel, it was a habit. It was a holy habit that he had developed. What we often miss is this, that God often does big things. God often does big things through small habits. Never est underestimate what God will do or what God will start by even just one little small habit. Never underestimate what God can do with your finances or with your relationships with your kids or with your parents or, or with your friends or with your spouse based on one even small habit. God can do amazing things. We started this series three weeks ago. And I've been reading this book by Craig Rochelle called The Power, the Power of Habits, right? The Power, I guess that's what it's called. Man, I can't even remember the title. I'm like, I'm like in chapter four now. Like chap, there's like section four. So I'm in section four almost. And, uh, and I come down to the book. But this is like a great book. And, and so I highly recommend you reading this. And you're going to learn a lot more than we're learning from this series, okay? This is a great series. But here's some of the things we learned. We're just going to recap a little bit, okay? Real and lasting change isn't behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation. Real and lasting change isn't behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation. You see, if it's not from the heart and it's only on the surface, it won't last. We could change outward things, okay? But it has to be bigger. There has to be a bigger why. Why am I doing this? It's easy to change something on the outside, but it's hard to change something on the inner. You do what you do because of what you think of you. It starts with our image. Our image creates our habits. And we get stuck into thinking this about ourselves. And that's why we get stuck in habits that are not good. We get stuck thinking, this is me. This is how I'll always be. And we follow some crazy Mandalorian creed, this is the way, okay? And I'm just going to do it this way because I have to do it this way. But it doesn't have to be this way. There could be another way. And you could choose. And God sees so much more in you than you will ever see in yourself. Who? Who do you want to become? Based on who you want to become, Okay, based on who you want to become, what's one habit that you need to start based on that? When you think of this new you, whatever that you is, what's one thing that that person does? It doesn't have to be hard. For example, you could say, you know what? I'm the no snooze guy. Why? Because I don't want to be lazy. And like, wait a minute. Everybody who uses a snooze is lazy. Well, what else do we call that? If you want to get up at 8 o'clock, get up at 8 o'clock. If you want to get up at 9 o'clock, get up at 9 o'clock. But don't say, hey, I'm going to get up at 7 and then procrastinate until 8 or 9 o'clock, okay? I'm a no-snoogist guy because I'm not, I'm not a lazy guy. That's the who I want to be. I'm not going to do Facebook before lunch. Maybe that's the person you want to be. It's like, you know, because the person I want to be who's fully engaged in the day doesn't look at Facebook yet. Now, maybe you do it for business or something like that, but maybe that's who you want to be. Maybe you want to be the who you want to be is a healthier you. So what does a healthier you do? Well, healthier people eat healthy snacks, don't they? So instead of grabbing a bag of chips, I'm going to pack a healthy snack for lunch. I want to be a better who. Who is that? I want to be healthier. So guess what healthy people do? What do they do? They, they take walks. Oh, I could do that, right? Because that's what healthier people do. So I'm going to establish this habit of walking. I want to be a better steward of my money. Well, what does somebody who stewards their money do? does what do they do i want to have a better marriage so what does someone who wants to have a better marriage do well one thing is they could serve water but i'll tell you about that in a minute you can beat the who you used to be and become the who you want to be i used to drink diet coke all the time okay that's not the who i wanted to be anymore so i beat it how i i don't even know but now i don't even like the taste right 
If you want to be spiritually growing, what's the habit that you need to form? Because what does a person who is spiritually growing do? Here's a great verse to encourage you. Paul wrote this. He said, let us encourage. Actually, it may not have been Paul because we're not sure if he wrote Hebrews or not. Let us not neglect meaning together. Catch this. As some have made a habit. Some have made the habit of not meeting together. It's not that they missed once or twice getting together. They missed that function. They now have established a habit of not always meeting together. Isn't that interesting? He goes on. He says, but let us encourage one another and all the more. Why? As you see the day approaching, the day that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back sooner and sooner every day. And I believe it's sooner than we think probably. You know, when COVID hit, for a lot of us, the habit was broken. We stopped getting together regularly. We just did. For some, it was weeks. For some, it was months. For some, it was literally years. Some are still in the habit. Some are living out what, what, what is written here in the book of Hebrews. They have made a habit of not meeting together. Now, I love online. I think it's, it's so cool. I never thought we'd be here. I, I never thought we'd be in that whole arena. I, I love the fact that what we share through music, through message, through who we are, is out there all the time and anybody can tap on any time. And I love our online family. I really do. But in person is better. It just is. You know, we switched from a Sunday because I, I, I'm a firm believer and I might be wrong, but I just think our culture has switched more to a, a slower down mode. And for a lot of people, Saturday's not that slow down day. Sunday is. And being out of the habit, I said, well, maybe we should do a different day of the week. So we started Thursdays. So that's why we record, but we're in person. You guys can come down and be. It's, it's, it's great to be together. So maybe next week, start a habit of being together, right? And if we ever change it up, we'll let you know. Just follow us on Facebook, okay? But you know, rows are good. And you know, the couches we have down here are awesome. Okay, they're a lot more comfortable. But you know what's better than rows? Circles. Circles are better than rows. Small groups where you're intimately connected are so much better than sitting in rows where you just watch me or somebody else. Now, are a small group a hard habit to start? Yes, it is. It's hard. It's hard because you don't know what to expect. It's hard because there may be people there you don't like. You think the 12 liked each other? Oh my goodness, just watch The Chosen. They do a great example of how they hated each other. Okay, but Jesus brought them together every week, every day pretty much they were all together, right? That's what he did. I've been in the habit of a small group since, I don't know, 19, 20 years old. It was a habit I started a long time ago. have never given up the habit. There have been times where it's lapsed for a little bit, but jump right back in. The habit I started long ago. Because I know in a smaller community, in a circle, I could grow faster than I ever can in a row. You see, it starts by creating new habits. New habits. Now, there's so much to say about starting and, and ending habits and stuff like that. But what I want to do today is I want to I introduce you to the cycle of habits and why they start and why we're so drawn to them without even thinking about it. Okay, 40% of what we do is habits, right? So here's the habit of cycle. This is what it looks like, okay? You have, now some debate whether there's three or four different elements of this, but I like what James Clear says about there's four, and, and I think there's good reasoning for why there's four. The first is the cue, and that, that's what triggers your brain, and it puts your brain in its autopilot. As soon as you see that, hear that, smell that, touch that, it, it cues your brain, and then you jump to the next one, which is you start craving. You start craving physical or, emotion or emotional or, or mental need. There, there's something there that cues and it says, okay, I need this, right? And then you move to the response, and this is the behavior you fall into. This is the routine. And then you get to the reward part, and the reward is what makes you feel good. This creates the pleasure. So you catch the cycle. Now what happens is the brain reinforces the cycle when the cue and the reward get linked together. As soon as the cue and the reward are, 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 are intertwined, then it's hard not to fall into the cycle because as soon as you see the cue, then you want the reward, whatever that reward is. So if you want to change what you do, you have to change your cues. You have to catch it where it starts. Otherwise, you will run right into the cycle for the reward. For example, some of you wake up in the morning because you hear the alarm, okay? And the alarm wakes you up and you're like, 
okay, I got to get up. And the first thought that comes into your mind is you're thinking coffee. I mean, the coffee machine is not even on, but you can smell it and you can taste it. And, and your mind's saying, go make the coffee, go make the coffee. Because then you will have that cup of coffee and guess what will happen? The reward is the taste. You're going to be like, oh. This tastes so good. And then, oh yes, I feel like I'm awake now. Now here's the funny thing. Some of us are immune to caffeine. In other words, we could drink as much caffeine as we want and it has no effect. I'm one of those people, okay? But psychologically, I could think, oh, oh coffee, ooh, whew, I gotta have my coffee, right? So as soon as the alarm goes off, I think coffee, I gotta have my reward I got, because I wanna, I wanna feel awake even though it's not doing anything to me physically, but I, I sense it, okay? Some of you, you're watching TV, and as soon as a commercial hits, that's the cue. The cue to what? I wonder what's in the fridge. Yeah, I thought, I'm, I'm hungry. I got to go get something to eat. And, and, and then the next commercial rolls around, and you're like, yeah, that wasn't enough. I got to go get something else, right? So, so you see how this works, right? Some of you, you see the McDonald's sign, and you're driving down, like, ooh, okay. And your car, like, auto drive. You just go right in because you want to seek that reward, whatever it is, right? And it feels good. And then sometimes it doesn't feel so good because you realize you just ate too much or whatever, right? But if you want to start to change, you got to start with the cue. So first thing you want to do is how you do it. Make it obvious. Make the cue obvious. However big you can make it, make it so you don't miss it. Okay, if you want to read you version every morning, then you, you put on a notification where you version comes up and says, hey, you got to read your, your daily read, okay? Put your Bible on the table Okay, next to your Pop-Tarts. So, you know, I got to grab my Pop-Tarts. I got to grab my Bible, okay? Bring your, you want to bring your lunch to work. You're like, I, I got to bring my lunch to work because I keep forgetting. And then I go out to eat and I spend more money and it messes with our budget. And I eat stuff I shouldn't be eating. So, I got to get in the habit of bringing lunch to work. So, how do you do that? You know what? Make lunch the day before. Put it in the fridge. And then guess what you put in the fridge next to your lunch? Your keys. So in the morning when you're searching for your keys for about 10 minutes, eventually you'll get past that. You'll look in the fridge. You're like, oh yeah, that's where my, my keys are. There. Keys, lunch. You grab both, you go to work. Guess what? You save money and you ate healthier, right? You just establish those habits. You're forgetting to take your vitamins, whether it's your morning vitamins, or your evening vitamins. Put it next to your toothbrush. So you go to brush your teeth or you take your vitamins. I don't know if it matters which one you do first, but anyway, you know you have to take your vitamins. You know you have to brush your teeth. So you do them both together, okay? Put in your calendars exercise, put in your calendar, pay bills Friday, whatever it is, set the cue in motion. Second is this, make it simple. Now I can use the word easy because I like the word easy, but the, the struggle is when we say easy, it's not easy. And so I want to use the word simple because simple I can do. Now it may not be easy to do, but simple I can remember. So make it simple process. James Clear in his book, he, he writes about how we should make it two minutes or less because that's simpler. So if you want to make it two minutes or less, then you have to do this with all the habits, but it's easier to repeat something that's simple. So if you want to read every morning, say you want to read some scripture, say you want to read a chapter in the New Testament every morning. Now, when you're in the Gospels, you may have to say, I'm just going to read one of those sections until I get to the next highlight, whatever that is, okay? Whatever's going to work to establish the habit. Some of you maybe I want to call, I, I want to be a better brother or sister or mom or dad. I want to, so I'm going to make one phone call a week to somebody to try to build that relationship. Just one phone call a week. For some of us, I got to, I got to start exercising. Where do you start? Five push-ups a day. Start with three if you have to, right? But you're going to start with something. Start with 60 seconds of planks. You know what a plank is? A plank is where you, you go down on your hands, okay? So your arms are straight, right? And you're like a board. That's why they call it a plank, right? And you try to stay there as long as you can. Try doing 60 seconds. That's even half the habit time, okay? Now, I'm being honest with you. You start doing planks, you're probably going to start with about 10 seconds and be like, oh, okay, until your abs start to build. As your abs start to build, you'll be like, 60 seconds? Ah, I got that, no problem. You're going to start with one piece of fruit a day. Or you're going to start with one, you know, protein shake a day. Something that's going to help you on a health journey. Whatever it is, pick something simple to do. Now, James Clear, when he talks about habits, and if you haven't read his book, great book too on habits, he talks about stacking. And, and here's what happens. You stack something to make it easier to remember, plus then you do more habits that create a better pattern, okay? So for example, I will do this, and then I will do this. So like, I will do this after I do this. 
one builds on the next. This is what Daniel probably did. I'm just guessing, but when Daniel prayed three times a day, maybe he tied it into his meals. Maybe he said, look, I want to remember to pray every day, so I'm going to eat my meal, but I'm not going to eat until I pray, because then my stomach's going to keep growling until I pray. Just, just an idea. We don't know, but good guess, right? So one small habit leads to another. For example, put your Bible next to your toothbrush in the morning. So guess what? I will read my Bible and then I will brush my teeth. Because here's what's going to happen. If you forget to read your Bible, which is your cue, you're going to forget to brush your teeth. And if you forget to brush your teeth, that's going to trigger the next one and the next one and the next one because we're stacking, right? So you forgot to read your Bible. You forgot to brush your teeth. And then you go to work and you're walking around work and you're thinking, I forgot to read my Bible, I forgot to brush my teeth, so I don't want to talk to anybody because I probably have bad breath, right? The next day, you forget to read your Bible, you forget to brush your teeth. Again, you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm going to so walk around like this all day at work, right? And you're doing this again and again and again. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, people are looking at you like, why are you walking around here all day with your hand in front of your mouth? Well, I, don't, I probably got bad breath because I forgot to read my Bible, which triggers the, the brushing my teeth which triggers, uh, I'm embarrassed. So, and then what happens is you see your relationships start to wane because people don't want to hang out around with the guy or the gal who's like this all day. And the next thing you know, you start losing contracts at work. Your boss starts to have problems with you. He's like, you know, it's just not going to work. And so he, he fires you and then you can't pay your mortgage. And then you're, you lost your house and now you're out on the street and then your marriage caves because your wife doesn't like living on the street. And now you're out on the street and you have a bunch of cavities because you did read your Bible because you didn't brush your teeth because you see how your stacking works. Okay. Now reverse it. Okay. You do it in a good way. Right. So you wake up in the morning. Right. No snooze. You hit your alarm. Your alarm goes off and you gently, if this is if you're married, this is a great habit. You reach over and you kiss your spouse. Good morning and your spouse reciprocates, hopefully, you, there you go, get startled waking up, okay? And they give you a kiss back. See, the one habit created another habit, okay? Then you go into the shower, you take your pajamas off, okay? And you go into the shower, and the next thing you know, right? One habit leads to another habit, leads to another habit, right? You go into the shower, and next thing you know, you got a visitor in the shower, and it's not your dog or your cat. And you're thinking, this is not a bad habit. And it all started with a little kiss that led to another kiss that led to a visitor in the shower and then all of a sudden you start thinking wow this is a great habit we could conserve water so you start this habit regularly you start conserving water next thing you know your utility bills drop you take that extra money you apply it to your mortgage your mortgage gets paid off quicker and now guess what you get to retire earlier all because you started with a simple kiss that led to another kiss that led to a shower that led to saving water do you see how this works listen to what paul writes he writes this he says physical training is good but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Physical training, it's good. It's important. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why do I do this? Because it's a temple of the Holy Spirit. I want to take care of my body. But where do these habits, where do they benefit us? They benefit us in the life after, but they also benefit us right now. <sighs> Listen, you've messed up. I messed up. We got bad habits. I know I got bad habits. I'm probably going to establish more bad habits, but I want to fix it. I don't know about you. I hope you do. But you see, Jesus fixed it, okay? He forgave us of our mess. He forgave us of, of our bad habits and, and the habits we started again. And he, he wants to give us a new start. That's the power of the cross. And that new start gives us that, that we are a new creation. We are a new creature. We are new in Jesus Christ, and the old person is gone. And we stop, we're stopping to think about who that person is, right? That isn't the way anymore. This is the way. This is who I want to be. And we establish habits that will honor God. And it starts with a holy habit, even just a simple holy habit. So who's with me? Who wants to do this? Say, I will honor God with a holy habit. I will honor God with a holy habit. If you want to just put this in the chat and say, I will honor God with a holy habit. Now here's, you're going to take a next step, right? One's going to lead to another. You're going to go to your small group. Next time they meet, you're going to say, listen, I, I made that commitment. I made a holy habit and this is my holy habit. And it would be reading scripture for three minutes in the morning, but you're going to take it to your group who's going to hold you accountable to make sure you're doing that. Why? Because we need each other. One of the hardest things with habits is getting started. This is why, let me, let me wrap up here with a, with, a, 
with the words from Zechariah. He said this, he said, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see what? To see the work begin. To see it start. You know, it may start with something small. It may be start with like, you know what? I'm just not going to buy potato chips anymore. Just not going to do it. They're not in the house. And that's my small thing. Maybe it's drinking soda. You're like, you know what? I'm done with soda. I'm done with with the sugary drinks, right? Maybe it starts out with, man, I can't lift much, but I can lift five pounds. And I'll do the five pounds for five times. That's all I can handle. And it starts out small. Maybe it's five push-ups. Maybe it's three push-ups. Maybe it's five minutes with God. Maybe it's one date night. Maybe it's $10, $10 a month in savings. It's the start that God sits there and says, man, this is great. You started. Let's, let's keep it going. And over time, over time, God will build that. But God rejoices in the start. Never estimate how God could start something big through one small habit. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit in us that works in us and through us to establish new habits in our lives. Lord, right now, all of us have stuff that we we know that our bad habits have gotten us to. And we're, we're, we're having trouble breaking them. So Lord, help us to figure out what those cues are so that we can change the cues up, we could start new cues, and we could start new habits. And instead of beating ourselves up so much over the stuff that we're doing wrong, why don't we just, would you help us to focus on the new stuff and establish new habits that become so much more consuming that we let go of the, of the old ones easily? Thank you that you are God who does that. Thank you for people in our lives that help us be accountable. So Lord, help us to establish a habit of being more accountable to people in our lives. And you know what that habit looks like. You know what we can do to do that. But Lord, let it start with just one holy habit that we do for your glory and your honor because we love you and because we're your child. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Please.